Hi, I'm Belinda Carley, the Director of the Institute of Personal Care Science and today I want to give you a brief overview about cosmetic claims and what is allowed and what isn't. So let's talk about the four types of claims you'll see on cosmetic products. The first cosmetic claim is really hard to define and hard to hold evidence for and this is where the best type of claim gets made or the only, world's first. These are really hard to support with evidence and they're claims you really shouldn't be making unless you've won a competition or been judged as the best. In which case, use that result, that seal of approval to really get consumer recognition. Because if you've been judged in an awards process and your formula has been recognized as the best, you might as well use that recognition because you've earned it. But if you don't have that recognition from an awards process, then you really shouldn't be saying your product is the best or the only or the first because it's otherwise really hard to prove and support with evidence. The second type of claim is what we call a soft claim. Now these are claims that can be made about a product simply because of the materials it contains. For example, a moisturising lotion containing oils and humectants like glycerin will by default be moisturising when applied to the skin. So you could say that it's moisturising. You could say that it will help uh, restore skin suppleness and, and stop it from feeling dry or being scaly. These are cosmetic types of claims that we call soft claims that are easy to support just because of the materials that a product contains. The same applies to shampoos where you're creating foam that's going to cleanse the hair, conditioners where it contains cationic agents, it will be conditioning for the hair. All soft claims and they're all okay. The third type of claim I want to talk about now is the one where companies can run into trouble. And this is where you're making scientific based or clinically proven or stronger types of claims. For example, reduces the appearance of wrinkles by up to 30% in 30 days, for example. Now that's a strong claim and it needs appropriate evidence. Please watch my other video which talks about how to select the best active because in that video I introduce you to a material and I show you appropriate efficacy data as well as how to formulate to suit the needs of the material to ensure that it is in a compatible base product for the best possible performance. It's used in the amount that's clinically proven to provide the results you're promising and I show you the in vivo efficacy data you need to support these types of claims. The other thing I wanna mention about this is if you are going to make a claim about your finished product based on the supplier's evidence, you'll need to get permission from that supplier and you need to reference that material in your claim. For example, if I was using the milk peptide complex in my finished product, I can't then say that the finished product has been clinically proven to provide those results because the finished product hasn't been tested. But I can use the supplier's data with their permission to make the following type of claim. Contains milk peptide complex which has been clinically proven to reduce the depth of wrinkles by over 30% in 14 days. That is a true claim and if I hold the supplier's evidence, I can support that with appropriate evidence to suit a regulator's requirements. And of course, if I've asked the company's permission, they're more than happy for me to talk about their ingredient providing that effect. Now notice how I mentioned the ingredient by name and I said the claim about the product containing the ingredient which has been clinically proven to provide that effect. That's a really important difference because if you're making a claim that the product can do it, you need to hold evidence that the product, the entire formulation has been tested compared to where you say the product contains an ingredient which has been clinically proven to provide that result. There's a big difference. Make sure you understand it before you put your product and claims in the marketplace. 
The other thing that's really important and something I demonstrate in that video is making sure that the end product has a compatible base for the requirements of the active. No point putting an active ingredient into a formulation in the wrong amount and don't just assume an amount, you have to look at the evidence to use the correct amount and this differs for every type of active ingredient out there. You need to also make sure it's in a compatible base. This means formulating to ensure that there aren't materials in there that might be incompatible with your active, otherwise it may as well not be present. It's about formulating that finished product to be of the required pH and adding your active at an appropriate temperature so that it's not deactivated by the base of that formulation. So make sure you get your formulation right too to ensure the best delivery, efficacy and compatibility of your active materials to get the results your consumers are being promised. There's another type of claim that's a real problem and that's where a material has been traditionally used for a therapeutic purpose, for example. So you can't talk about plant extracts or essential oils providing therapeutic benefits. In fact, the definition of cosmetics around the world is almost unanimous in that it is to improve the appearance which is why all cosmetic claims need to be appearance or visibly based. Now the reason for this is they're cosmetics. You shouldn't be suggesting that your product is suitable to treat a physiological condition that may need medical diagnosis and treatment. And it's not appropriate to suggest that because a material's been traditionally used for a therapeutic purpose, that it's okay to be used for that in your cosmetic product either, because it may not be giving your consumer the therapeutic benefits they're looking for, and in any case, it's simply not allowed under regulations. You can't even link to third-party websites where the therapeutic use is referred to, because that's not permitted either. Remember the definition of a cosmetic product, and that is to help improve the appearance of the skin, which is why your claims need to be appearance-based. Now, you may also see in vitro data talking about efficacy within the cell. This is not permitted in your marketing materials either. The reason for this is because what is happening in vitro or in the cell can't necessarily be seen by the consumer. So you need to hold in vivo efficacy data that shows appearance-based changes to comply with the regulations and to ensure that your consumer is purchasing a product with truthful claims. Claims based on in vitro efficacy may or may not yield a visible result in the end consumer. And in any case, claims that are based on in vitro data doesn't give you a direct input to get in vivo results you'll find an amount gets used in in vitro testing that may or may not correlate to what is effective in an in vivo test condition, which is why clinical efficacy data needs to be based on in vivo tests to support your claim. The fourth type of claim I wanna go through is claims about natural or organic status. And I have a video on what is natural too. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation on the internet about what is natural in a cosmetic product. But if you've got a brand in the marketplace, make sure you're not saying the wrong thing. To be recognized as a natural or organic product, the best thing you can do is get certification showing that your product is truly natural or organic. Even if you don't want to go to the certification process, you should only be saying your product is natural or organic where it's been formulated to those principles or using materials that would be suitable in a certified natural or certified organic product. Don't mislead your consumer into believing they're buying a natural product if you don't have the evidence to show that every input in your formulation would comply with the certified standards. So there you have it, claims in a nutshell. Don't be caught saying the wrong thing and don't scramble for evidence after a regulator's picked you up for saying the wrong thing. Make sure that your claims comply with cosmetic regulations and that you hold the evidence first. 
make sure you're making claims appropriate to the evidence you hold, whether it's for the ingredient or the product. And if you need help with this to get proper training to make sure you don't get it wrong, please contact us. We're happy to give you this training so that you can make the best marketable claims about your cosmetic products, but stay compliant and give your consumer some fantastic results they're looking for. Happy formulating.